Government figures show that around 50,000 people are testing positive for COVID-19 every day. Any one of the symptoms of fever, cough and loss of taste or smell qualify for a diagnostic PCR test. People who are self-isolating at home with COVID will experience a range of other symptoms such as muscle or joint pain and fatigue. Those who've been vaccinated and children will however tend towards milder symptoms which may seem like a common cold. Government guidance for those with more concerning symptoms such as breathlessness is to seek advice either using an online automated symptom checker or by calling 111. This approach is not common worldwide. Many other countries have instituted more proactive follow-up for people who test positive. The World Health Organization issued guidelines in March 2020 recommending clinical assessment be offered to all patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. The UK has yet to meet those standards. WHO also produced similar guidelines directed at resource-restricted countries. All four UK nations have failed to meet those standards too. Let's take a look at the possible consequences of the UK's passive approach. Someone who's at home with symptoms of fever, cough, loss of taste or smell and fatigue may feel pretty rotten for a few days, but they should start to feel better on day three or four of illness. If, however, they're no better with continued symptoms, including some shortness of breath, the guidance is to seek advice using the online symptom checker. There, they find information about managing breathlessness at home, which they read and follow, assuming there's no need to call a doctor. A few days later, they're very short of breath. They return to the online symptom checker, but this time the severity of their symptoms leads to advice to call an ambulance and get to hospital. Someone who's developed COVID pneumonia could easily be in hospital for a month. This scenario has played out many times during the first two years of the pandemic and has installed a common belief in both the general public and many medical personnel that people generally won't need hospital in the first week of their illness. If we compare the time to hospitalisation in the UK with a country like Singapore, which has a much lower case fatality rate, we find that on average they get people to hospital in three days, and that's half the time it takes in the UK. Research also shows that short times to admission are associated with short hospital stays. The UK's belief that people only need hospitalisation after a week is likely to be perpetuating late admission. Longer hospital stays and poorer outcomes are the result. How can we prevent delayed admissions? Evidence shows that there are a few red flags that should be receiving more attention. Firstly, it needs to be general knowledge that shortness of breath is a sure sign that someone needs medical input. Attempting to manage breathlessness at home is counterproductive and guidance to attempt this should be removed. Secondly, it should be understood that any fever should dissipate after a couple of days. A prolonged continuous fever is a sign of disease progression. Thirdly, we must start to recognise confusion as a sign of deterioration. People with COVID can have what is known as silent hypoxia. This describes a patient who has no or little awareness of being short of breath and has a normal respiratory rate, but when examined is found to be hypoxic, which means there's not enough oxygen in their blood. This can lead to impaired mental functioning and confusion. Hypoxia can very easily be monitored using a pulse oximeter. Pulse oximetry can be interpreted using a traffic light system. Values of 95% or more are considered normal. If the reading is either 93 or 94%, you must make contact with your GP for evaluation. Values of 92% or below mean that you need to get to A&E for urgent care. Pulse oximeters are relatively inexpensive. Monitoring service is also freely available to people at higher risk. Try searching for oximetry at home. Proactive monitoring would facilitate early intervention, including oxygen therapy and administration of medications, which have been proven to be beneficial if used appropriately. Some people will still need to be admitted to hospital, but early assessment and admission is known to lead to shorter hospitalisation periods, as well as having other benefits. COVID has put intense demands on the NHS. Infection control has required a 4% reduction in capacity, 
and 6% of available beds are occupied by COVID patients. This leaves significantly reduced capacity for non-COVID healthcare, demand for which does not stop in a pandemic. In a normal year, we'd be looking to go into winter with 85% bed occupancy. A figure of over 85% is deemed to be unsafe and exceeding 95% is dangerous. Occupancy is currently in excess of 93%. COVID patients in the UK are routinely spending a long time in hospital. Over a set period of time, every bed occupied by COVID patients could, on average, accommodate many more non-COVID patients. If we could avoid delayed presentation, each COVID patient would spend less time in hospital. So overall, fewer beds for COVID patients would be required. With early home interventions, the number of people with COVID requiring admission to hospital should reduce too, leaving yet more capacity for non-COVID care. The existing pressures are not sustainable. Bed shortages inevitably lead to riskier decisions having to be made. Long COVID affects around one in eight people who are infected, whether their illness was very mild or much more severe. 6,000 referrals to long COVID clinics are being made every week, and one in 10 of these are healthcare staff. The passive approach taken to early clinical triage of COVID patients has contributed to us having one of the highest death rates in Europe. Every single case of COVID-19 represents an opportunity to prevent a hospital bed having to be occupied and to bring down the current death toll, which still stands at over 100 per day.